So good morning everyone and welcome to Kalamazoo Venture Tuesday. For my WMED colleagues, today's event qualifies for MedU and CE credit. For CE credit, the activity code is 22687. Everyone, a uh, little housekeeping, please be sure to mute your microphone when you're not speaking, uh, but do feel free to leave your camera on if you'd like so that we can see your smiling faces. I will take down that slide for right now. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Kalamazoo Venture Tuesday is an opportunity to see inside the minds of investors as they provide feedback to company presenters. The purpose of KVT is not necessarily to secure immediate investment, but rather it's a teaching opportunity for our participating companies and for you as members of the audience. Each of our quarterly meetings features a panel of three active investors and three startup or early stage companies. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to pitch followed by 10 minutes of feedback from the investor panel. We will not take questions from the audience. However, you may ask a question or make comment in the chat, and that's located in the conversation bubble at the top of your screen. Today's presenters in order are Clayton Cohn with Lighting Designer, Elka Lipka of TSRL, and Cooper Mosajenko, I hope I said that right, from Our Nation Archive. But we are going to get started first by introducing our esteemed panel of investors. So I'd like to start with Adrian. Adrian, you're here with the Mercury Fund. Can you say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm Adrian Fortino um, uh, with the uh, Mercury Fund. Uh, I have um, started out as a um, automotive engineer out of Michigan many, many years ago uh, and was in that world for, for a long time. Then caught the startup bug <clears throat> and decided uh, the right time, uh, Sandra, remember, remember this, to jump into startups in April of 2008, which is uh, <laughs> in, uh, maybe not the best time, but it was good good to be able to kind of uh, get that experience. I, I started three software companies here in the Bay Area um, and then uh, ran those for several years and then moved over to the investment world. Uh, first at Invest Detroit, uh, running the Invest Detroit Ventures funds, and then joined Mercury um, about six and a half years ago, um, and uh, and now have a have a, a number of funds uh, there. So we're primarily software investors, so not so much on the uh, med tech side, but um, uh, but hopefully can still be helpful. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I am also supposed to have Lindsay Aspergren from North Coast Ventures, but I don't think he's on yet. Lindsay, are you here? I didn't think so. Um, and Ken Kuski of the Blue Water Angels. Ken, have you joined us yet? Until they join us, hopefully they will, I do have some great stand-ins, some um, good friends from the past who are here to be participants, but I'm pressing them into service. Jack Ahrens, would you please introduce yourself and thank you for pinch hitting today. Hi, Sandra. Thanks. Yeah, this is I'm Jack Ahrens with uh, T Gap Ventures uh, here in Kalamazoo. Uh, we uh, are winding up our last fund here now, but we typically have invested in uh, early stage medical devices uh, throughout, actually throughout the country. Try to focus mostly on the Midwest. Uh, I've been in the venture business since uh, '79 when I was uh, president of an SBIC in Rockford, Illinois, and then in Minneapolis for 20 some years with uh, uh, Pathfinder Ventures up there and started down here in 2002. Awesome, thank you, Jack. And, and Mary Sue, say hello. You're gonna pinch hit also a little bit as best you can. We'd love to hear a little bit about you. Sure, good morning, everyone. Hi, Sandra, nice to see you again. Um, I actually started my career as a corporate tax attorney. Um, so a good experience there. Uh, moved into the startup space probably 15 years ago. And at this point, uh, I'm enjoying my own consulting firm. Um, so I have clients here in Michigan and primarily in Pennsylvania. I'm still barred in Pennsylvania. So um, yeah, you know, basically, uh, uh, you know, a lot of my work is uh, with early stage startups and then with uh, uh, much larger or organizations and kind of managing the intellectual property aspect. So a real range. And and you spent time though in, in the angel, in the angel capital world. Yes, exactly. Yes, I did. Um, so I was part of the uh, initiative here in Kalamazoo to launch KZU Angels, which is the affiliate of Grand Angels in Grand Rapids. Okay, 
Okay, so thank you. So thank you. We do have three panelists who will be providing feedback and if uh, Lindsay and Ken are able to join us later, we will we will bring them in as well. So our first presenter today is going to be Clayton. So Clayton, if you go ahead and share your screen. Good morning, everybody. I am not seeing it yet. Uh, it's not up yet. Oh, <laughs> just saying good morning. OK. I thought you were getting ready to start. I'm like, wait. Good morning, Clayton. Good morning. <laughs> OK, you see it there? There, now you're coming. Whenever you're ready, um, I've got 10 minutes on the clock, and you may begin whenever you are prepared and ready. Stand by just a moment. I need to grab my presenter view here. OK. Just need you over there. I don't know why it's on this screen. OK, hello. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Clayton Combe. I'm currently a product manager with Clipboard Health. But before that, I spent 13 years in the film and television industry as a cinematographer and lighting director. Now I learned a lot about lighting during that time. I learned how to do flashy lighting for concerts, studio lighting for TV shows, and my favorite, how to light movies. But the biggest thing I learned is that these lighting setups don't just happen. Look at all the people in this photo. Dozens of lighting professionals planned and executed the setup down to the last detail. And if something goes wrong and time is wasted, that's a lot of money down the drain. To prevent this from happening, we create lighting plots, diagrams of how the setup should be laid out and many other technical details. So all the technicians on the job can see exactly how it should be built. The thing about making a plan in the lighting industry is that there will be many, many versions. The look could evolve or the requirements of the shoot could change, but whatever the reason, there will be multiple drafts. So the person in charge of lighting, like the cinematographer, lighting designer, or gaffer, needs to scout the location, hire crew, create a plot, make an equipment list to order the gear, distribute the plot and list to the crew for feedback, and then distribute all the changes that get made up until and including the actual setup and performance. It's a ton of work, and it involves constant communication with a lot of people. Each of these people is essentially a business, and they all bring their own workflow that determines how they keep track of the information they need to do the job. There are several options out there that address these needs, and they break down into three categories. High-end software is well-made, but also very expensive. It's hard to learn and a lot of its features are overkill for anything but really big jobs. Low-end software is less expensive but lower quality, and their feature sets aren't useful for every kind of job, so it'll work this time but needs to be replaced next time. The DIY option is what a lot of people end up resorting to, piecing together their own solution, but this takes a lot of time and energy to make it work. Sometimes it's using Photoshop and some images of lights they found online, and sometimes it's a sketch on a napkin. I know there's something romantic about this, but for a lighting technician, this is a nightmare. And I've seen it far too many times. The friction here is that there is no industry standard workflow. So lighting professionals have to create their own. This means less time to create the actual lighting plot or just not create a plot and hope it works out. On top of that, lighting is collaborative. A crew has to be able to communicate and work as a team or else mistakes will be made. Time and money. There are thousands of dollars at stake for every wasted minute on a film set. Any one of these factors can get a designer a bad reputation as being difficult to work with, taking too long, or delivering lower quality results. Most lighting professionals are freelancers. Their entire career depends on their reputation. None of the existing solutions addresses all of these pain points, and that's where a lighting designer comes in. Lighting designer is a much needed fresh look at how lighting professionals create and share their lighting plots. It's a B2B tool that provides a single environment for all the start to finish steps of a lighting setup so the user can stop thinking about the workflow and focus on the work. Instead of targeting only the high-end productions, it's flexible enough for all job sizes and for the majority of lighting professionals. It's affordable, easy to learn, and available on pretty much any device. And most importantly, LD allows users to share their work in real time with their crew. It's basically Google Docs made specifically for professional lighting. This will save a lighting professional hours of time and potentially make their career. 
The idea here is to fill the large gap between high and low end software, including the best features of both without their limitations. And Lighting Designer delivers this at a price that's actually reasonable for customers who sometimes need some of the features of high end software, but mostly just need a reliable way to do their job. For example, the most adopted high end software is Vectorworks Spotlight. It has every single feature for the most elaborate designs, 3D animation and rendering, weight calculations for hanging truss, everything. But it costs $153 a month. It can only be used on a computer and you can't make a plot in five minutes. And even when a Vectorworks plot is done, it's not a shared workspace. Now, I developed the first version of Lighting Designer myself for iPad only as a one-time purchase. It includes many of the plot design features, but none of the collaborative workflow. Of course, I was just doing this because it solved my own problems as a lighting professional, but since I released it, I've been working with users to get a sense of what's valuable to all lighting professionals. And by now, we have 2,000 annual paid users all over the world. That's with no marketing, no sales department, just being available in the App Store. And it made me realize that this product has a lot of value to the professional lighting market. The most common way users describe Lighting Designer is exactly what I needed. I do get a lot of requests for Mac Windows and Android versions, and of course, users would love more options for sharing. The current, the current version of LD is a one-time purchase, but moving forward, we'll be switching to a SaaS model with a freemium structure. To demonstrate the core value and features, we'll begin with a free download that allows you to work, allows a user to work with one plot. From there, the technician and designer subscriptions provide viewing and editing of shared plots for individual users, and the classroom and company subscriptions address multi-user enterprise needs for educa education and larger scale productions. Each of these tiers is tailored to appeal to specific segments within our target markets. The professional lighting industry is a complex market, but basically breaks down into three silos, film and television, live events, and education. The film and TV industry is the largest of the three. It includes movies, TV shows, and anything else that uses a camera. This is the one I have the best penetration in so far. The live events industry includes theater, concerts, and events like trade shows. And the education market includes film and theater schools and online courses, which teach the skills needed to enter the other two industries. The most notable behavior of these markets is that there's very active networking. Lighting professionals change jobs all the time, often even daily. But among these three, I estimate a total market size of 350,000 people worldwide. This translates to a market value of over $203 million annually. Currently, Lighting Designer is only available on iOS devices, but I did a survey in the Lighting Designers Facebook group, which has over 36,000 members, about which devices people preferred to use to create lighting plots. The overwhelming majority, about 92%, use Mac and Windows computers. On the other hand, iOS represents only 6% of devices. This means that the current product with a proportional number of users on all four major platforms would have over 33,000 users without even adding any new features. Also, Lighting Designer is only available in English, so about 70% of our users are from countries that speak it as a primary or secondary language. But there are very active film industries in countries like India, China, Brazil, Japan, Germany, and Mexico. These six countries alone represent a market of $83 million. Overall, English only covers about half of the worldwide market, so supporting new languages will allow us to capture much more. One of the great things about the profession lighting market is that they're very reachable through standard marketing channels. Hundreds of thousands of people attend trade shows and subscribe to monthly industry publications every year. And there's a very engaged social media community. But Lighting Designer has one extra powerful marketing channel, its own collaborative use. Someone who runs a show using LD will invite their crew to share their plots. This spread pattern works a whole lot like Google Docs. Most people who use it now got a link sent to them at some point. Now we're already in a great position to network with our 2000 existing users, but on top of that, we can select users in specifically influential positions to target with direct sales. Let's say we approach a popular cinematographer who shoots Netflix shows for most of the year. I know a few of those. They're in a position to share LD with dozens of other lighting professionals every month just by using it to do their job. And all those crew members will go off to their other jobs and do the same thing. In the film and TV market, TV shows are the best place to spread new technology. They have long shooting schedules and a lot of turnover in their crew, so a lot of potential reach. In the live event space, regional theaters are reachable through existing channels or direct sales. And they host touring shows, which have the capacity to network the use to other theaters. And within the education market, popular film and theater schools like NYU are ideal because they offer the most mixing between film and theater crew, which is more rare in the professional industry. But the great thing about the education market is that it is itself a beachhead for the professional markets. In the U.S. alone, there are around 18,000 graduates every year, and they should enter the professional market using the Lighting Designer workflow. 
my continuing role will be as CEO based on my background in the lighting industry and my understanding of the markets. Our first priority is to create our new multi-platform version of LD. So our first hires will be in design and engineering. And we'll hit the ground running with marketing so we can make the most of the built-in network effect. In 2021, we plan to release the Mac and Windows versions with collaborative features and individual subscription tiers. And in 2022, we'll introduce our Android version and enterprise tiers once we feel confident in our ability to scale. And by 2023, we'll add new languages to open more international markets. By the middle of that year, we expect to become profitable, still expanding, and well on our way to becoming the new industry standard. Our number one goal is rapid yet sustainable growth in terms of personnel, users, and technical scalability. As we gain users, we'll be hiring more people and doing more marketing, especially in the first three years. Our goal for the end of 2025 is 25% market capture with 50% paid users for an annual revenue of $25 million. I'm asking for $300,000 to assemble our core team and create the new version of Lighting Designer. Most of those funds will be used to create the product itself and to focus marketing on its ideal customers using a small agile team to build and iterate quickly. With the various streaming services and other studios in an arms race all trying to outdo each other, this market will only continue to grow. Since 2009, scripted content, content production has grown 250% at a steady rate. During the pandemic, productions have embraced the value of advanced planning and the ability to work remotely. This dovetails with the trend over the past few years where filmmakers have once again favored planning instead of relying on technology to bail them out on the day. There have also been recent industry efforts to put a limit on working at ours. Finally, so our largest professional lighting market is growing and demanding more efficiency. The timing could not be more perfect to establish a new standard workflow. This is an opportunity for you to address a large and growing market that's begging for a good solution to its problems. Thank you so much for having me here today. And at this point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Clayton. Um, Mary Sue, let's have ladies go first. And I know you have to pop off in a little bit. So, uh, sure. I do. Well, Clayton, very nice job. Your delivery is excellent. And um, I think if there's uh, one box that you tick off very well, uh, that is an explanation of your, your sector experience. Uh, it's always good and reassuring uh, when, in, when potential investors hear that you actually have a very deep level of expertise in, uh, in the startup. So nice job there. I would say some room for improvement. Um, it took a while to get to the market problem and the specific solution. So, you know, I understand that uh, professional lighting is difficult and um, there's, um, um, as, as you know, with your experience, room for improvement for delivery, but I'd like to hear what the actual failure rate is. So I'd like to hear a little bit more of a quantification of the market problem. What what is the failure rate and what are the estimated costs of that? Because it sounds like it is difficult, but but people work around and they actually get the job done. So what what specifically um, it, it just if you could quantify that, mm -hmm. you know, the problem and then also speak more directly then with your solution to that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I would just. Uh, lastly say that the revenue potential is a little unclear to me we can talk about that a little bit more you talk about the high-end software at 153 dollars a month and you've got 2,000 paid users I'd, I'd i'd like to hear a little bit more about and we can dig into that about what the revenue potential is then for your group interesting so it's more about sorry catch up it's more about this slide here which has the um the subscription prices on it um, but it would it would help you if I actually mention those by name or mention those by quantity. I, I think so. So that I okay. so that I have a better understanding. And then in comparison to the, you know, 153, if that's the high end and you're mid tier. You know, so, you know, and then low end software, I'd like just to have an understanding you've positioned yourself. From in mm -hmm. that in that price point. So, you know, I yeah, so I, a better understanding there and then we can get through the revenue. Uh, numbers later okay. but did my yeah. did my first um comment make sense a little bit more specification on them on the problem it did and it's funny because i've gone back and forth with various people who have had input on um on this and, and sandra i know you were one of them and there have been many others who have all had a different opinion on exactly how to approach this i have backup slides and they've been in and out of whether or not they're actually part of the main presentation and I have okay. detailed backup slides about what the actual 
problem is and how we solve it. And then I actually also have a, a backup slide here of like how we're positioned in the market in value versus price. And basically what it has always come down to is that the, the problems themselves are numerous and they're also each very small and they add up to a lot of problem. Um, but whenever I try to address them one by one and explain how we do it, how the software does address the problems one by one, um, I lose people. People's eyes Clayton. just are like, well, I don't care about this. So um, the suggestion that I've gone with most is put, as, put them as backup slides. And if people are interested, then elaborate on them that way. Okay. Is there a, a better way you could think of? Because otherwise Please, I was going over I, I have an idea. <clears throat> Given your experience in the market, even anecdotally, I would. I wonder if you could pull um, just use cases or, or situations where a lack of lighting uh, performance collaboration caused certain number of days delays uh, day in, in shooting a film, right? And so maybe on the average film, how long does lighting, a lack of lighting collaboration cause that film to delay? Or mm -hmm. if you don't have the overarching kind of, you know, average, maybe you can even use specific films that you've been on or shows that you've been on to say, you know what, this, this caused, this, this specific issue caused us to be a week late, a month late, five days late, and the cost of that for this one was this. And then mm -hmm. people can extrapolate that. Because yeah. the good thing about this is like it's people funny. I made an the entire consumption, the consumption of like, okay, yeah, I know lighting's a big deal to entertainment. Um, go ahead, sorry. Clayton, were you gonna say something? Um, Did we lose Clayton? I don't know. I'm not hearing anything now. I can hear you. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, okay. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we yeah. thought you were going to say something, Clayton. Oh, yeah, I, I was. That was like a minute ago. I think there's definitely <laughs> a delay. Um, yeah, I, I understand what you're getting at. It's funny because I made a, a big like Excel calculator spreadsheet of, of how to calculate the exact like cost of lost time because it doesn't end up in days. It ends up in hours, and then that adds up and adds up and adds up. And so I typically end up measuring it in hours per day. And and figured that on on in my experience on typical shows we would lose at least an hour a day um, if things went wrong. Uh, here's a specific use case: like if um, if the lighting team doesn't know where each camera shot is going to be looking, then it's very possible they could run the main cable run through the middle of that camera shot, which has happened before. And that means you have to not only do you have to stop for an hour to redo that because you know the main cable run can be hundreds and hundreds of feet long and is big heavy cable and there are five of them at least and um, if you have to break that and run it around some other way it's not just the time spent uh, doing that it's that nobody on set has any power during that time so that would be a slightly more extreme example but you know any any number of things that have to do with miscommunications and that's the problem here is that there are so many things that can go wrong and when none of them do they're invisible and when they do then the entire lighting department it's like well i'm never hiring you again <laughs> so we only have a few more minutes um adrian yeah. do you have anything else you'd like to to say before i pop over to jack Sure. Um, just a couple points here. I, I want to extend on that because it's, it's a pretty important point that, that Mary Sue brought up. So what I would be thinking about is is over the course of a given shoot, let's say it's a three month shoot, you know, that that would go across, let's say, you know, 90 days, right? An hour a day, 90 hours. Um, what does that cost? Right. Uh, what's that lost downtime cost, right? Mm. In a movie shoot, I, I bet you it's a pretty significant number. Hundreds and, of and thousands pays. of dollars, if not millions. Right. Yeah. So that that's the kind of that's the kind of thing I think you really want to crystallize in it, even if it's anecdotal, and then allow people to extrapolate, if okay. not like an average sort of uh, industry average. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on 
So really, I mean, uh, I love SMEs, subject matter expertise experts. Like, I think it's great. Like the, the best founders that we run into are the ones that come from a market pain and understand it and also have a network in said market or industry. So that's awesome. I think the thing that you want to be just thoughtful about is, you know, a $200 million total addressable market is definitely on the low end for for people who are looking to make equity investments right um and so you you i could see you certainly find some angel investors who really kind of um understand the problem statement and and really believe in in you because you're i mean you're a credibly uh, impressive guy um you are not going to find many like institutional vcs necessarily that are going to want to follow on that round because of the market size where it is and that's okay like yeah. but there's lots of companies right that that should just take a little bit of money just to do this thing and and i wasn't clear where your head was there but i just wanted to make sure we kind of talked about that right and just say hey you know if you can take this 300 grand to get to profitability and call it good that's fantastic mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. My my next move after this is actually to approach like more West Coast, specifically LA companies, and figure out who has been investing in film industry startups and tech, and uh, and see if I can talk to them. Great, thank you. So, Jack, yeah. do you want to uh, to weigh in as well, please? <laughs> yeah, hi, hi, Clayton. Yeah, it was a uh, an interesting presentation. Uh, I back in. When I was in uh, college and even post college, I've done uh, a couple of different shows with lighting and stuff, so I understood some of the the uh, pain. What what I didn't get until just really a little bit ago with your conversation with uh, Adrian, because uh, you show those uh, your kind of blueprints of the lights and stuff, uh, and I was having I was struggling with that because so much of that is going to be positioning when you're on the on the set and everything. Uh, when you got talking about trying to interface with where the cables are going, when you were talking with Adrian a minute ago, then things made a little bit more sense. But I think, you know, in your presentation, you ought to capitalize on how these all work together. Because I had the whole impression during your, your presentation that this was all about the rigging and where you're putting your lights. Uh, and I was having a hard time seeing the how it uh, interfaces with all the different people in a, on a set. And and the last thing I had, which Adrian also hit on, was uh, you know the market size. Uh, you uh, you really are going to be you know looking to probably to uh, angels or you know maybe a strategic type you know partner just wants to be in this business. It's it's going to be hard to get venture capital uh, with that small of a market size. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's definitely who I'm targeting with this. Excellent. Okay, panelists, any last so, thoughts or questions before we move yeah, on? Yeah, Sandra, yes, just one quick one that, that occurred to me. Clayton, if you do decide, hey, you know what, I see more opportunity out there and I want to kind of go after a bigger market, I do wonder about like commercial building design. I know that we're kind of, the commercial building sector is down a little bit with pandemic, but it'll, it'll come back. I, I, I'm curious about what that lighting design looks like right in a construction setting and if there's the similar level of collaboration you know required I, i'm sure it's different but i do wonder if that uh presents another kind of vertical for you in, in yeah. the future yeah when it comes to like i i have thought about that and they're actually in a weird way like two years ago there was another product that came out called the lighting designer that was specifically for architectural lighting um and and it's it has a lot more to do with like making orders and wiring and uh, rating and harmonics and a lot of like electronic stuff that we typically don't have to deal with on a film set uh, because it's smaller scale and um, <laughs> because I've been around for longer than they have I'm like guys why are you taking my name what are you doing this is <laughs> this is bad for both of us I don't understand it we're gonna get emails to each other like. Hey, I wanted an architectural anyway. Um, so I had thought about that. I mean, ultimately, the technology of arranging objects in a space is applicable to many, many different things. And Sandra, I think you had mentioned like factory floor layout or something along those lines. So okay. it's certainly a um, and, and it even ties in with uh, the idea of something like Figma. I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the design tool Figma, which uh, kind of pioneered the idea of uh, collaborative um, collaborative layout because it's for um, designing for for screens um, 
and this would very much follow that type of model. So they've they've had great success with that type of technology and being embraced and then emulated in their market. Uh, so obviously that's taken care of, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. there, are, there are multiple potential applications, but this is the one I'm focusing on right now. Always great job. Nice to start. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Clayton. Thank you. We are going to go on to our next presenter. Another exciting presentation. Elka, do you have your slide deck ready? You can go ahead and pop that up there. I do. Um, set the share tray, right? All right. There we go. Yep, I'm seeing it. Go ahead and put it in presentation mode. All right. Awesome. Okay, I've got the timer ready, and whenever you're set, you may begin. Um, you see it in presentation mode? Yes. On split screen on mine, that works. Great. Thank you, Sandra, and good morning, everyone. We're going to completely switch markets here now. We're going to talk big markets, long timelines, a lot of costs to get there, and also about a slightly unusual business model. Um, did that go? Oops. Comes to the end of the slideshow that we didn't want. Hmm. I'm gonna have to skip out of that for a second. Can we hold this for a yeah, second? Yeah, go ahead. I'm I'm I've paused. We've we're only a few seconds in. Go ahead and reset and just have to get my dual monitoring thing here figured out. All right. Can you see that now? We're still on your last slide. It says questions. Hmm. Try unshare and share again. Still questions. Yeah, just keep going backwards. We can you do it that way? I know it's not the easiest, but okay. okay. Ready? Yeah. Okay, go never. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, talking about a slightly different business model too. Um, TSRL, as I mentioned earlier, is a preclinical um, accelerator, and will developed a new strategy for translating university research concepts into viable drug candidates. Um, most of you are perhaps familiar with the drug development continuum. It's a long process with various stages and funding can often be realized at very early stages. And once you have a candidate that moves into the clinic, but that stage right in between um, a pre-lead identification and the filing for the application that allows you to go to the clinic is often referred to as the valley of death because it's quite difficult to secure funding there and uh, costs start to increase. So TSRL is positioned right in this valley of death with the value proposition of having a drug development expert team that is leveraged across a portfolio of projects um, to chaperone them through this uh, space to IND. We provide operating capital through in-kind investment and non-dilutive government funding and leverage our operational um, excellence to de-risk the asset till we get to a point that we know it is a viable drug candidate with proven safety and proven efficacy. And only then do we uh, start a new co-formation in collaboration with our partners and investors and um, design it for acquisition um, at, at the end of the milestone we're planning to reach. The feature technology we want to talk about today is our front runner project in that portfolio. It's a microneedle delivery of a influenza drug called Zenamivir. And um, the reason why this drug needs some help is that the, the influenza, even though we talked about COVID quite a bit in the past year, continues to be a significant uh, influence and a significant global health risk. Um, about 10% of the global population get infected with the 
uh, flu each year with three to five million becoming severely ill and up to 650,000 people dying each year, despite the fact that we have vaccines and anti-flu therapeutics. The vaccines um, are poorly taken up frequently, up to only 50% of people get vaccinated each year. And that paired with the fact that the strain match is sometimes not ideal, um, leaves room to still have a need for a therapeutic. There are four licensed therapeutics on the market currently, and we'll go through these in greater detail when we talk about the competitive landscape. But Zenamivir as a drug has some advantages that, that uh, haven't really quite realized in in the uptake of the product. So the product is a dry powder disc inhaler that has to be administered twice a day for five days. The drug itself has a lot of advantages um, and is actually a better drug compared to the other offerings. Very active against resistant strains, has itself a low resistance profile, good side effect profile, and um, is an approved product. It also has some significant disadvantages. It can't be delivered orally and has a very short half-life. There is an IV formulation, um, but that's only allowed for compassionate use and difficult to administer outside the hospital setting. But most prominently, the inhalation product is difficult to use for children and, and the elderly and contraindicated for people with pre-existing um, respiratory conditions, so asthma and, and other diseases that make them actually prone to contract, contract the flu more frequently than the rest of the population. So the solution we provide with a microneedle delivery, um, which the technology is depicted on the left side, it's a drug device combination. It consists of a hydrogel microneedle drug-free device that is backed by a reservoir that contains the drug. Upon insertion on, in the skin, these microneedles swell and create pores through which the drug can diffuse. And at the end of the treatment course, the entire drug device patch is removed. The needles have now swollen and the tips are round and no longer sharp and can be disposed of and, and disposed of and no residue is left in the skin. So this has a couple of significant advantage over the current inhalation product. It allows pain-free delivery that can be self-administered by the patient. It delivers directly into the systemic circulation. And this technology, in contrast to other microneedle technologies, can actually deliver pretty high doses in the 100 milligram range. So the target product profile for this product is a single non-invasive administration and that delivers the Namavir for up to five days. Some of the highlights on, on the product candidate here, which is named TSR 066, we're in a, a strong intellectual property position. We have a, a term sheet and, and a license agreement in front of us currently from Queen's University in Ireland, where the technology originates. Those are internationally issued patents. Um, the project has been funded with 3.6 million in SBIR funds and 4.2 million of additional funds are pending. Um, we've just reached the proof of concept in mini pigs that the, that the product candidate can actually deliver Zanamavir over the course of five days. And we um, executed a couple of agreements, one with a local manufacturer um, in our ecosystem here for manufacturing of toxicology and clinical supplies, and a co-development agreement with PharmaThere, which is a publicly traded company out of Toronto that has also licensed the hydrogel microneedle for application um, in the central nervous system and psychedelic space. So we're collaborating to co-develop the manufacturing piece of the device part, and then each company will take their products in, in, uh, forward uh, for their respective indications. We completed a pre-IND meeting last year with the FDA and got agreement in our um, abbreviated regulatory strategy, which I will show you in the development plan. And overall, this platform technology and this mo mode of delivery allows us to actually expand the market uh, beyond what Relenza can capture and also uh, add future product candidates in, in the reservoir format behind the microneedle. Our exit strategy is still being developed. There's a two-pronged approach. There are potential pharma partners interested in it, both from a therapeutics and the patch uh, transdermal delivery side, as well as government stockpile contracts. 
to talk a little bit about the global market. It's sizable and projected to reach 1.7 billion by 2026, which is the year that we uh, project to launch our product. Um, with the patent coverage, we have an addressable market that's just over 600 million. And our financial model suggests that at the year of launch, assuming 10% market penetration in the US and Europe and 5% uh, in Europe, we'll realize 96 uh, million in revenue. Pricing will be um, competitive to Tamiflu. And as you can see here, the, um, the competitor products um, uh, outside of Tamiflu have really not reached their market potential. And to add a little bit more detail to this competitive landscape, this table shows you on the left side some of the product features you really want to have for an ideal influenza therapeutic. And the current offerings meet some of these criteria. And the latest player to the game, Zobrusa, that was launched in 2018, had almost all these boxes checked, but very shortly after product launch, resistance began to emerge against this drug. And as you saw in the previous slide, it really has not reached its market potential. Um, on the execution side, we have a core team with the uh, product development expertise heavily sampled out of uh, the Pfizer diaspora that um, that um, is in our ecosystem. I myself uh, was with Pfizer and um, Asperion prior to joining TSRL. My uh, chief operating officer, Don Reyna, um, has a deep background in, in um, research operations management and quality insurance was at Pfizer and MPI Research. And our part-time um, CFO, Shelly Sowers, has a broad finance and um, M&A expertise, uh, brokered the Ash Stevens um, sale to uh, Piramal, and uh, was also in the process with a couple of her other clients to close um, various fundraising rounds. On the technical side, we have a number of senior technical advisors. John Damagala was a therapeutic area leader for infectious diseases at Pfizer is a chemist by training and also has um, intensive knowledge in IP strategy. Margaret Weaver is um, one of the few non-Pfizer folks here. <laughs> um, she worked for many years for Novartis and is our drug safety advisor. Sharon Watling is our clinical advisor. And Mark Ammon, who was the head of regulatory affairs here at the Pfizer side, um, has helped with the pre-IND meeting and is our regulatory advisor. Um, the next slide is shows you the details of the product development plan and what we have currently funded and what we uh, anticipate funding for and raising fund, funds for. So the current phase two SBIR um, has funded the activities that reached gas to the milestone of the PIC um, data and we're in the process of transferring and initiating the initial feasibility work on the manufacturing part. The various manufacturing uh, steps are awaiting funding from pending grants, and then we're raising funds for the rest of the development plan. We got agreement with the FDA that with the 505B2 regulatory strategy, we can actually get to NDA with just one talk study in the pick, one phase one study, and one well-designed well phase three study, which allows us to get to product launch um, projected for 2026. If we plug this into the financial model and the fundraising we're attempting to do, um, we can see various value inflection points at, as we reach the milestones of opening the IND, completing phase one clinical trial and uh, phase three clinical trials, and then launch of the product. Um, overall, this is a very cost effective way of getting to market. We project with 30 million, we can get to market. And the risk adjusted um, net present value actually amounts to just over 700 million um, if we assume that the market can be expanded and, and we take a good portion of the current Tamiflu market, um, capture that with our product. With the current fundraising efforts and grant uh, funding projections, we stay cash flow, flow positive. Um, through the anticipated exit um, after phase one clinical testing, where we start realizing milestone payment and then with product launch um, royalties on net sales. So for the current ask, um, we have, have made investments of about 500,000 um, of in-kind investment of TSRL funds, um, 3.6 million in grant funding that we have secured and 4.2 that are pending. We're currently seeking to raise 5 million um, that would allow us to get to IND and complete those milestone steps. 
if the grant funding comes through um, some or all of it, um, this round would allow us to go, go through phase one clinical testing, which essentially is clinical proof of concept because we can demonstrate that um, we reach the drug concentrations that are have been shown to be efficacious in humans with an elation product. So that would be a major milestone for the program. Um, future round would aim to raise 25 million in early 2023 to complete the rest of the clinical development and the filing of the NDA. Exit strategy are um, primarily focused on acquisitions with the formation of the portfolio company, which this is the milestone that we're just approaching right now after we, we met the PIC PK milestone. Um, we're talking to larger companies that either operate in the infectious disease space or companies such as Novin that, that are experts in transdermal delivery of um, medications and have an interest in microneedle delivery. There are also a number of smaller or mid-sized companies that could potentially be of interest. The transdermal microneedle ma market is an interesting market in that it, uh, most companies aim to manufacture the microneedles themselves. So there's some opportunity there to build on the relationships with some of the smaller players that, that could um, result in, in taking the product further than out licensing it after phase one. Um, but if attractive licensing opportunities present themselves, either with um, strategic partners, um, we certainly entertain that. There is a um, pull from, from BARDA, the agency that picks up um, products after the NIH um, discontinues funding at, at that stage. BARDA will pick it up. Um, a lot of the existing influenza um, products have been funded through BARDA, which will ultimately also stockpile the product candidate. And with that, um, I open this up for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, it was very interesting, but you have gone far over your time. So we are um, pretty deep into the Q&A period. So my panelists, I'm gonna ask you to, to kind of keep it brief. Um, let's see, is, um, are you still with us, Mary Sue? I am. Okay, because I know you have to go, so I want to try to keep picking on you first before you leave us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Actually, I'm going to leave and then jump back in. But, um, you know, Elke, I think um, uh, what, what may be beneficial is to uh, be a little bit more concise with the narrative. Um, and so keeping my own comments brief, um, I think for me it would have been helpful to, to see a slide showing clear title to intellectual property have a graph of, I, as I understand it, you uh, entered into a license agreement. Is that correct? With well, yeah, we're in the hospital. Yeah. Queens, with Queens. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to see that right up front, so that I under, so that I within the first or second slide, I understand what what who's the subject of this presentation really, what the relationship is, what the and since and since we are talking about commercialization of. Um, intellectual property, clear title to intellectual property and a clear statement of what the next commercialization steps are are needed. So if you could sort of focus a little bit more on the conciseness of that narrative, I think it would be helpful for investors to understand what what's really uh, the main subject here. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we'll just keep in the same order. Adrian, can you go next? Uh, sure, this is not my field of expertise, so so um, uh, I, I don't know. This is all Jack uh, for sure, so I'll be I, I just had a, just a question. On the competitive landscape, there was a GSK, Zena, Zavamir, I don't know, the, and then there was, an, I think, your version of it. I wasn't clear the differences because I think it was the same. Maybe it's the same drug. Is it just a different delivery? Uh, of yeah, it? So that was that was the inha disc inhaler. That's the inhaler, inhaler. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. The okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't think I had much to add, and I think we're we're tight on time anyway. So I'm, I'll leave it to to Jack to opine. <laughs> okay, Jack, <laughs> they're gonna put you in the hot seat. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Elke, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I was picking up from a little bit of what Adrian just said and what Mary Sue said. I was a, a little confused on what the IP here was. I mean, the, the whole microneedle thing, I thought you did a good job of explaining how that works. But uh, I'm not sure. Are you licensing Xanamavir then? Part of the problem was that you broke up a little bit during your presentation. 
And wow. so I, I lost some train of thought there, but I, I couldn't figure out whether this is a, a, just a licensing deal with a delivery technology or, uh, you know, where you're at on that. Yeah, so the technology, the delivery technology is what we're licensing for the use with an Amavir. An Amavir is actually off patent and, you know, there's there's no rights that anybody claims on that. So that can be freely used with the delivery technology. And, and that's the innovative aspect of this drug device combination. So then are, are you like, did you just say then you're licensing the uh, microneedle technology? Yes, we license that from Queen's University for the currently for the use with the Namibia. Okay. So, and uh, does your license get broad enough where you can go out and, and do it with other drugs? I mean, I like the idea of the microneedle delivery, but I, you know, is this a one trick pony? I guess is where I'm trying to get to. No, we have options to license other products, and we've, you know, we've. Uh, part of the fundraising would entail to secure the entire platform um, that that has been cost prohibitive uh, up to now but between this company in canada who licensed it for use with ketamine and psych psychedelic drugs and that partnership and this specific use that we carved out it it would be um advisable to to license the entire platform that that's something we've been thinking about okay well then i would go back to mary sue's comment and and I would focus a little bit more on the IP so that the person listening to your presentation has has a clue what what you really are covering. And so, but uh, nice job, thank you. Thank you. Good panelists, we've got another minute or so. Any other thoughts, comments, suggestions, feedback for Elka? Oh, I guess that's it. OK, well, thank you very much, panelists, and thank you, Elka. We're going to go into our last presentation now. We are bringing up Cooper. So go ahead and unshare, um, Elka. Okay. All right, let me pop this up really quick. Can you get it in the presentation? Okay, we see your screen and it looks ready to go. So anytime you're ready, you can go ahead and begin. Sounds good. Okay, hey everyone, my name is Cooper Mojienko. I'm the founder of Our Nation Archive, short for HNA. Um, what we do is stream digital insight upon things that typically you can't see. Expertisively domain rooted within academia, the economy and real estate specifically. So there's a big data problem occurring right now within our world. Uh, we're fortunately, we have enough data to do analysis on basically anything, yet there is an absence of data transmutability. What transmutability is, is the change ability for the data in order to react to it. This leads to an absence of render ability to generate the conclusions you need executively, leading to a lack of known big data variable availability and then delayed in relay of information. So the R Nation Archive solution, um, we are a market and industry insight at one glance, servicing real time data into a 3D interactive ecosystem and we case studies we case study our digital visualizations innovatively and clinically while servicing our customers granting clarity during an unclear time through this pandemic so arc academia is our education academia platform for big data analysis and visualization um, initially servicing business to business with higher learning institutions gathering all of their data, making sure they have the right visualizations as well as real time data input. Following is ARC Economy. This is where we collaborate with executive board members, business management and investors, see which kind of data they would like to spatially confine in insight within real time. And we serve a 3D interactive dashboard 
specifically for their industry sector and sector. And then lastly, Arc Deed. Arc Deed is um, tailored to real estate as we, instead of mapping out 2D plots, we can map it out in 3D extrusions, allowing technically much more insight and comprehension digitally. So what's our nation archives competitive advantages? HNA transcends from your traditional 2D data relaying. Usually all of this data is kind of comprehended in 2D, but fortunately with our technology now, we are enabled to understand things visually through exploratory and interaction before diving in statistically. Analyzing real-time business operations visually, transcribing spatial transmutation statistically, and providing one glance rationality executively. So currently, our nation archive has five claim patents for each of its servicing, specifically within computer graphic processing, data processing, and selective visual display systems. Uh, we look forward to actually innovatively processing more patents as we begin case studying and acquiring our first year of customers for our B2B servicing. Our addressable market within our nation is college universities, businesses in general, real estate agent firms, and in the end, social media news users. Our management team was originated quite differently, you could say, compared to the rest. Uh, myself, in the beginning, I had this ideation about four years ago. Uh, technology was there, but a bit too expensive, and um, I saw that it needed a bit more time. I actually played football with Taiwan. Then I brought Taiwan on for as a co-founder, CMO, following with Jared Menzel, co-founder, COO, and Patrick Kozak, CTO. Patrick has a strong background within technical expertise of website development. Jared has a strong background within sales and psychology. Taiwan Swain has a strong background within marketing and communications digitally. So how we are going to market our service is through the utilization of artificial intelligence and machine learning, digital campaigns. We would like to ensure that all professionals are in actual need of this service opportunity and insight, rather than just issuing and channel distributing to the general public. We would like to market our ethical awareness visualizations, which are regarding the whole entire nation and expertise rooted domains, national and global visual business insight through Facebook, Snapchat, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Regarding our business model, HNA starts by utilizing LIDAR digital technology hardware. This technology enables us to gather spatial moving things all around the world or in, in particular environments. We then bring that back down to our corporation to utilize our professional innovation and workplace operation software utilities, kind of um, tailoring all this data together, manipulating it into a analytical variable insight, which our customers need. Bringing it back down to a third party technology integration and a continuous finalized service to its end user. During this whole entire process though, as the B2, our B2B revenue stream is being produced, we are taking much consideration on our effective digital data servicing that we are doing. This can be considered one glance case study visualizations and HNA established and planned three years after our B2B servicing to create a B2B, B2C revenue stream for end user as well, rooted within expertise domains. 
Our B2B subscription pricing structure, they're all four um, services are quite different, but the, mo the main emphasis here is that we have a minimum service fee. With that being said, as our customers would like more, we are ready to provide them with digital insight visualization relating to their data. Um, we start off very slow, collect uh, clinical innovation case studies for our one glance digital visualizations that we present to our customers and then slowly ramp up to within 2026 an overall of 325 separate customers within various industries. Following our B2C subscription price structure, this will be three years after our B2B launches. Uh, this is more solitary flat rate as we'll already have our effective one glance visualizations, which we would like to throw in our cloud and um, kind of just expose to the general public related to real estate, uh, higher level learning, and any single business aspect of industry insight we can possibly provide. Regarding our B2B and B2C financial projections, we um, are expected to kind of almost break even, not necessarily yet, only $900,000 um, negated in 2026 for our net profit. Our funding requirements and exits, we right now currently are asking for 400,000 up front and 400,000 credit line negotiated by performance indications. The use of these funds would be state of the art modern technology data equipment such as LIDAR. This will allow us to launch into operation officially to solidify our qualified MVP. Also, use of funds would be through with further patent filings, as I mentioned before, that is much of an emphasis on, as well as business software application. Our Nation Archive plans and established to have at least two more future rounds of funding, a Series A and Series B, and exit strategy, strategizing as a collaboration to a satisfied tech stack buyout. Thank you for your time and I would now love to answer any single question which um, y'all might have. Okay. Mary Sue, you still there? I am. You know, <laughs> I've, I've seen uh, Cooper's pitch deck um, and already gave comments, so I will uh, rely on Jack and Adrian. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay, Adrian, how about you? Yeah, th thanks guys. Uh, good job, Cooper. You know, thanks. I think what you want to start, the, the the problem statement is too broad and generic. You, we need to start with something more specific um, to kind of allow the, the audience to understand kind of what the problem is. It's too much to say uh, big data, right? It's just like there's a lot of jargon in that. Like you gotta, you gotta focus in on the specific problem is it that real estate developers want more insights on where people are moving? Are people staying in the suburbs? Are they going back to the suburbs? Is is like what are the specific pieces of data that you can get uniquely? And, and I don't know where lidar necessarily comes into play. Lidar is primarily, you know, it's used in lots of different, you know, use cases, but but a lot of it's used in in kind of AV right now. Um, yeah. But um, and I think that kind of transcends over to another sort of Tam question or Tam comment. I think I saw that you said that you had a capacity to, to service 10 million businesses in the U.S. Um, so um, that would be our addressable market, um, our options, who we can service, our economy. 
Yeah, that's a huge number of businesses. Like that's that's yeah. it. That's it. That's a unrealistic number of business to just to actually serve. What you'd want to do is break it into certain kind of big enterprises, mid market SMB, and then figure out where where is you know because usually you don't try to serve all those all levels in the same like you know the same sort of you know time frame let's say like in that first three years that you mentioned right and so you say okay does my offering or does our offering really serve a need for smbs or for big enterprise or for mid-market right and why and what are those specific offerings and value points that we can more clearly um you know communicate i mean that i think the kind of overall it's just like a little bit too generic going to get more specific on on what you're offering because i don't i i came away with like, like i don't understand kind of what specifically you're offering and this is what i do like we focus most of our investment work on kind of ml ai big data platforms gotcha okay thank you okay jack would you like to weigh in yeah give some feedback yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, thanks, Cooper. Uh, going beyond uh, where Adrian left off, I mean, I first off, my, my impression was that this was a technology looking for a marketplace. I, I mean, I really didn't understand, you know, how a lot of this was going to play out. And so, and then when you got into going after several different markets at one time, very diverse, a small company just can't do that. And you know, when you look at your market projections and your sales projections, uh, you know, the logical place for me to start would be your, your, uh, you know, your real estate side. That one seemed to have the, uh, the fastest ramp. Uh, and then you could take that market and you could better tone your uh, presentation and what you're really offering. I mean, that one slide you had near the beginning showing 3D data. That, that didn't mean a damn thing to me, frankly, <laughs> you know, in, in the 3D, uh, you know, uh, form. So, I mean, I understand big data and the value of it, but I think it just, I would pick one of those markets and your uh, your deed market looked like maybe the best place to go. Uh, the problem with going after real estate is that it's uh, a very fragmented market. There's, a, you know, thousands of real estate agents out there, but uh, I think it's the easiest one to show value to. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Also, I, I give you credit. I think this is the first time I've seen one of these pitches where you didn't show getting to profitability in year two. <laughs> Congratulations on that. <laughs> I think I think guys, there's there's I think there's there's good there's good stuff there. It's just refining that to a little bit more specificity and focusing in a little bit more. And you can always get to other markets to Jack's point, but just really focus in on the right verticals to start in, and that'll be big enough. Awesome. Okay. And I guess, Alice, go ahead. Mary says to say any any more. Go ahead. Yeah, I I was just gonna add Cooper. I I think um there was some interest by University of Chicago, wasn't there? I I, uh, I seem to recall that you made a comment, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, so you might want to bring that into the narrative a little bit. If there is a, a thought leader who's interested in what you're doing, um, whether that's the University of Chicago or some other university or or um, experienced entrepreneur, that that would be helpful, I think, in lending some credibility to to what you're doing. We um, actually have just, were in, we just connected with the University of Chicago again this week um, about regarding utilizing their quantum supercomputers. Okay. So it's a, a pretty cool accelerator as well. And there's a bunch of perks, but um, yeah, University of Chicago, that's, we are definitely communicating with them. Hopefully they like us as much as we like them. <laughs> well, I University of Chicago tends to like big data, <laughs> so so awesome. But anyway, okay, so that would that would just strengthen your narrative, I think. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you um, to all of our presenters today.
for sharing your really innovative companies. I enjoyed hearing about them and learning about them. So thank you for that. And thank you to all of our investors, my, my two who did not know they were gonna be on my panel today. And Adrian, <laughs> thank you so much for offering your insightful feedback. It's very, very helpful. And lastly, of course, thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us today. Um, I hope that you'll join us again on July 27th when we have another Kalamazoo Venture Tuesday meeting that will feature three new companies and three new investor panelists. You can register for that and all the other upcoming events at our website, wmedic.med.wmich.edu. Um, I want to uh, quickly remind all of my WMED uh, colleagues, remember that today's event does qualify for MedU and CE credit. That CE credit um, activity code is 22687. It's there on the screen. I'm going to take it down now. It's just a quick reminder. Um, again, thank you all for your participation and your attendance today. I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you all. Good job. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.